Hello, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Acutus Biotherapeutics Q2 2024 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask the question during this session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. You would then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to Lotha Veravan, Vice President, Finance and Investor Relations. You may begin. Thank you, Tawanda. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to review our second quarter 2024 financial results and business update. Slides for today's call are available on the investor section of the Arcutis website. On the call today are Frank Watanabe, President and CEO, Patrick Burnett, Chief Medical Officer, Todd Edwards, Chief Commercial Officer, and David Topper, Chief Financial Officer. I would like to remind everyone that we will be making forward-looking statements during this call. These statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ. We encourage you to review all of the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including descriptions of our business and risk factors. With that, let me hand the call over to Frank. Thanks, Lata, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Very excited to be able to provide you with an update on, uh, on the most recent quarter of our performance. Um, so let me start off on slide five of the deck. Uh, you know, we have continued really strong performance since our last earnings call, and I, I continue to be delighted and very proud of the Arcutis team and our execution in the quarter and thrilled about the momentum that we're building towards the second half of the year. Once again, we saw strong growth during the quarter uh, in our expanding Zareev portfolio as healthcare providers and their patients see how Zareev cream and Zareev foam address real needs in the treatment of psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis, respectively. Solid growth in prescriptions for both the cream and the foam, coupled with additional gross to net improvements during the quarter, drove strong revenue growth in the second quarter, both year over year and compared to Q1 2024 with net revenues of 30.9 million, 56% of which was cream and 44% was the foam. <clears throat> We've now generated more than 351,000 prescriptions for the cream and the foam combined from over 14,000 unique prescribers to date as our product delivers positive clinical experience for healthcare professionals and their patients. We improved gross to net again this quarter, resulting in a blended GTN in the high 50s across both products for the second quarter down from the low 60s last quarter. So looking forward for the remainder of the year, uh, we believe we are well positioned for sustained revenue growth with continued momentum on the psoriasis and subderm launches, and atop atopic dermatitis will be additive in the second half following the launch of that indication late in July. We're also very excited about the recently signed deal with Coa Pharmaceuticals to expand our promotion into the primary care and pediatric space although we wouldn't expect to see meaningful revenue contribution from those efforts until 2025. And we are delighted that we were able to favorably renegotiate the terms of our debt agreement with SLR, and David will provide more details on those terms later in the call. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Todd to provide some further commentary around Zareev cream and foam launches in psoriasis, sebderm, and atopic dermatitis. Todd? Thank you, Frank. I'm extremely enthusiastic about the expansion of our commercial portfolio, HCP, and patient response to both Zareev products and the immense opportunities that lie ahead. We achieved $30.9 million in net product revenues for Zareev for the second quarter of 2024, reflecting 43% growth over Q1. This was driven by healthy prescription growth, substantial clinical gross to net percentage improvement down to the high 50s and the team's success in pulling through current prescriptions as well as improving coverage for the foam. For the remainder of 2024, we expect continued prescription growth and some gross to net improvement, primarily for Zareev foam, as gross to net discounts for Zareev cream 0.3% have already reached our expected steady state in the 50% range. Moving to slide eight. The Zareev portfolio performance is showing promising growth and strength reaching for the first time close to 10,000 scripts in a week. This new high shows the momentum we can continue to create for the Zuri portfolio. The portfolio had quarter over quarter volume growth of 42% or 
over Q1. We expect continued build as we include atopic dermatitis beginning this quarter and will add a fourth indication in 2025 if approved by the FDA. On to slide nine. The Zareev psoriasis TRX performance is continuing to show strength, and these results demonstrate that we can sustain our growth in psoriasis. We see the steady trend line with 8% growth over Q1-24. Zareev foam experienced volume growth of 102% versus Q1-24. As we stated before, while the trajectory has moderated from the initial launch uptake, it is still phenomenal growth and a key factor in our portfolio's performance. On to slide 10. We have coverage for Zareev 0.3% cream and foam from all three large PBMs and continue to progress with formulary access and downstream plans. When we examine the percent of prescriptions being covered by insurers, we see an encouraging trend in Zareev 0.3% cream with roughly four out of five prescriptions covered. And for Zareev foam, three out of four prescriptions are covered. This is very positive for the portfolio lending to the gross to net improvements we have shown. I would also reiterate that the contribution to revenue growth coming from further gross to net improvements will likely moderate in coming quarters as we advance closer to our expected steady state blended gross to net. Going forward, most revenue growth will likely come from prescription demand growth in psoriasis, sebderm, and new demand in atopic dermatitis, as well as from expansion of our prescriber universe. I'm now on slide 11. Cerebe 0.3% cream is foundational to the brand with a value proposition that is meaningful and impactful to patients. Prescribers have an option that can resolve plaques that affect many different parts of the body, hard to treat areas like elbows and knees, but also the sensitive areas like the face, groin, and underarms. The combination of efficacy, rapid response, and a tolerability profile are becoming well recognized by dermatologists as differentiating factors. And the quotes here from real patients and prescribers confirm this brings value. Moving to slide 12. In SEVDERM, Zuri brings transformational value. The clinician and patient feedback about Zuri foam from the real world usage gives us the insight that these patients have been yearning for a solution such as this. The happiness of patients when they experience relief in a more efficient and convenient manner reinforces how the foam is addressing the unmet need for patients whose only option for decades have been steroids and antifungals. Now on slide 13. While there have been treatment advances, significant opportunity remains in the atopic dermatitis market today. 68% of patients are still being treated with topical corticosteroids. non topicals only represent 19% of the total market opportunity. These are agents that have been on the market for several years now, and uptake is likely limited due to safety concerns. While this market has also seen an increase in biologic and oral jack treatments, these treatments still only account for 13% of the total market, since the benefit risk profile combined with the high cost, typically positions are used as later lines of therapy and for hard to treat or severe patients. The incremental value that Zuri brings within this more established AD market is highly differentiated. With no box warning, no limitations on body surface area treated or location of treatment, and it can be used for any duration, which is very important for a chronic disease. Zareev is also well tolerated and does not contain any penetration enhancers, sensitizers, or common skin irritants. And very importantly for patients, Zareev is the first topical AD treatment that only requires once a day application. This unique combination of benefits positions are really well for use early and chronically in the treatment algorithm. On slide 14, with the performance in PSO and SEBDERM and the recent AD approval, we are creating a portfolio of Zareev solutions for dermatologists that will sustain the brand growth. 
the benefits of a Zuri portfolio of products that will address three different dermatology diseases where the current standard of care is topical steroids is unprecedented and creates simplicity for the dermatology prescriber and patient management. The common clinical attributes is a read across indications will make the prescribing simpler and repaired with common market access, copay card, and an efficient and predictable fulfillment pathway further simplifies the dermatology practice operations as well. We are well on our way to becoming the preferred topical brand in dermatology. Now on slide 15. We are extremely pleased to have entered a co-promotion collaboration with COA that allows us to bring Zuri to primary care and pediatric physicians. We have been working on identifying a primary care partner for some time, and we are thrilled that COA checks all our boxes with respect to covering a broad PCP target universe, having a proven track record of successful co-promotions, and possessing the bandwidth to prioritize Zareev promotion. We are working with COA to identify the PCP and pediatric targets who have the highest potential to write Zareev. The COA sales force will have a dedicated focus on our product for at least the first two years. And there are significant commercial synergies in this co-promote with our existing dermatology focus strategy. COA will use the same branding and promotional messaging and materials and product reimbursement training. And COA's PCP and pediatric targets will have the same access to samples as our dermatology offices. They will also be able to access dermatology experts for peer-to-peer -peer programs to advance the understanding of Zareev in the primary care setting. The patients in the PCP and pediatric offices will benefit from our existing copay card and favorable market access coverage. Our collaboration plan is built on transparency, teamwork, and shared accountability to ensure a successful partnership. I'll turn it over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Tom. Starting off on slide 17, I'm extremely proud of the team's performance in delivering on the promise of topical reflumilaf to the dermatology community in the clinic and continuing to hit all of our timelines with regards to regulatory milestones. Echoing what you heard from Todd, I see that HCP excitement around Zareev cream for atopic dermatitis continues to grow as we release more data. Building on the foundation of their clinical experience with Zareev in psoriasis and subderm, dermatology clinicians find Zareev's product profile to be well-suited for what they and their atopic dermatitis patients are looking for. We've already started looking to expand the indications also for Zareev foam, having recently filed another SNDA with the FDA in scalp and body psoriasis in July. If approved, this will represent our fourth indication for Zareev, and I'm going to give just a brief peek at why we're so excited to bring this indication to patients. Writing out this table, we look to the submission of our SNDA, SNDA for the treatment of mild to moderate AD in two to five-year-olds, which is planned for Q1 2025. And finally, we're also looking forward to ex our expected IND filing for ARQ234, our biologic CD200 receptor agonist for atopic dermatitis in 2025. On slide 18, we see our next new therapeutic focus is leveraging the properties of Zareev foam to help patients with scalp and body psoriasis. We know that approximately 40% of psoriasis patients also suffer from scalp involvement, and our foam has demonstrated reliable clearance of plaques as well as rapid and robust impact on itch. One of the major challenges for managing psoriasis patients with scalp disease is the complexity of the regimen. Often they end up with several prescriptions for their scalp and at least one or more for their body. And if these are steroids, then the potency is vastly different between the solution that might be used on the scalp versus the cream that would be used on the face. One of the consistent themes about the Zareev profile is that it simplifies treatment for a patient. And Zareev foam for psoriasis is a perfect example of that. You'll see in a moment that we designed the pivotal trial to highlight this benefit through the use of co-primary endpoints for scalp and body IgA. Zareev foam can be used once daily on any area of the body where psoriasis occurs including hair-bearing areas such as the scalp, where creams, lotions, or ointments are suboptimal. So I'm on slide 19. I'm just going to quickly review the data from Erector, our pivotal phase three trial for Zareev foam in scalp and body plaque psoriasis. We selected patients with at least moderate severity of the scalp and mild, moderate, or severe disease by body IgA, and that's Investigator Global Assessment. 
we had 432 patients who were randomized two to one to receive reflumilaster vehicle foam over an eight-week dosing period. And as I mentioned, we, provided, we measured two co-primary endpoints of scalp investigator global assessment, or scalp IGA, and body investigator global assessment, or body IGA success at week eight. Now, on the right side of the slide, we have a brief summary of, of our results from the erector trial. We achieved positive and statistically significant results on both of our co-primary endpoints of SIGA success and body IGA success. Over 66% of patients experienced highly statistically significant improvements in scalp symptoms, and approximately 46% of patients also achieved highly statistically significant improvements in body psoriasis with clear separation from vehicle. As a clinician, I'm very pleased to see that the foam performs essentially identically to the cream in treating body psoriasis, giving dermatology clinicians the option of treating plaques anywhere on the body, including the scalp of Zareef foam, which should considerably simplify treatment regimens for these patients. The incidence of adverse events was low and generally similar between active treatment and vehicle. Overall, the most common adverse events included headache, diarrhea, and COVID-19. We previously announced these results in September of 2022 and are expecting a strong reception to this new indication based on the positive experience that healthcare providers have already had with foam and seborrheic dermatitis. With that, I'll pass it over to you, David. Thanks, Patrick. I'm on slide 21 showing financial results both year over year and quarter over quarter. As you've heard, our net product revenues for the quarter were 30.9 million, which is up 547% from Q2 of 23 and 43% from Q1 of this year. For the second quarter, our R&D expenses, which include our clinical research, medical affairs activities supporting Zareed, and manufacturing costs for pipeline candidates, were $19.3 million, which is down from Q2 of 2023 due to continued decreases in the development costs of topical reflumilast programs, and also down sequentially from Q1 of this year due to lower spend in our early stage programs. You will recall that we had some one-time spend in Q1 of 2024 related to 234. SG&A expenses were 58.2 million for the second quarter versus 46 million in the same period last year, as we invested in both our current and future launches, including our field force. Our SG&A expenses were slightly higher quarter over quarter, primarily due to incremental stock comp expense incurred in connection with the retirement of a former executive. We believe we are investing appropriately in our product launches to support the Zareeb growth trajectory while constantly looking for ways to achieve savings and efficiencies. <clears throat> On page 22, slide 22, you can see we had cash and marketable securities of $363 million on our balance sheet as of June 30, which translates to a cash burn in the quarter of $45 million. Our current capital, together with our product revenues, enable us to continue operating the business for the foreseeable future, including our continued investment in commercial launches. I'd like to add, as, as we've said repeatedly, we do not envision a need to come back to the equity market to support our existing businesses. I'm now on slide 23. This slide summarizes the key features of the recently signed amendment to our debt agreement with SLR. The management team, together with our board, took advantage of the opportunity to renegotiate our debt to provide our QDIS with considerably improved financial flexibility. The revised deal, which becomes effective at the start of October of this year, provides a number of very important improvements, including an extended maturity to 8129, a decrease in the interest rate of 150 basis points, the flexibility to repay up to $100 million in the fourth, fourth quarter this year, together with the ability to redraw that money anytime through the first half of 2026, thereby saving us considerable interest expense. We've also deferred our 6.95% exit fee on the redrawn $100 million to the, to the August 2029 maturity date and removed restrictions on asset purchases. With that, I'll hand it back to Frank for some closing comments, and then we'll open for Q&A. Thanks, David. Uh, you know, our goal here is to make a positive and meaningful impact on the lives of people afflicted with chronic dermatologic diseases. And with Zareve now launched in two indications and the atopic dermatitis launch now underway, we are proud to be helping millions of medical dermatology patients while allowing us at the same time to create additional shareholder value. We're confident that our strong performance in Q224 portends for a strong and sustained growth for the rest of 2024 and beyond. And with that, we'll wrap it up and open up to uh, Q&A. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder to ask the question, please press star 11 on your telephone and then wait to hear your name announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Vikram Purahit with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, we had two. First on uh, Zareev, both for psoriasis and also for Sebderm. We were just curious if you could comment on your latest um, findings on refill rates and um, your, I guess, most recent estimates for how many tubes or cans per year you think patients are going to be working through. And then secondly, I just wanted to get your sense on where you think steady state growth, gross to net, excuse me, could be for um, the foam product once that settles out over the coming quarters. Thanks. <coughs> yeah. Hi, uh, hi, Rick. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Todd, do you want to take those two? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Frank. So in reference to uh, PSO and Sebderm and the latest, uh, the refill rates, we see on, uh, on psoriasis our refill rates are roughly around 38% of our, of our total volume. And uh, with Sebderm, um, we see something similar, um, although we do see some signals that there will likely be a higher refill rate on uh, Sebderm eventually than that of uh, psoriasis. So we're very encouraged uh, with the refill rate uh, percentages for both products. And then uh, in reference to utilization of those products, we're uh, assessing that. And uh, at this time, our estimates are that for a patient, average patient utilization per year, uh, for Sebderm, it'll likely be around uh, two cans per year. And for uh, psoriasis, it's going to be like around two to three uh, tubes per year uh, for psoriasis. And then reference to the, uh, the steady state gross to net for foam, uh, you know, we've seen uh, an encouraging ramp relative to improvements in our gross to net for foam, especially with the um, line extensions of the three PBMs and that uh, we anticipate that we're in a, a very good position to be able to be in that steady state high 50s, uh, you know, well uh, in, into the, the end of this quarter, uh, beginning of the fourth quarter of this year. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Tyler Van Buren with TV Cohen. Your line is open. Hey guys, uh, congratulations on another solid quarter and all the progress. I have uh, two for you. Uh, so the first one is um, just the prescriptions for the cream have made a nice week over week jump over the past two weeks. So I'm curious to understand if this is pull through from the early atopic derm launch already and if you believe this could be a new trend line moving forward. And then the second question is um, considering the latest performance for the foam, do you believe that the foam and the cream will split overall Zareev sales pretty evenly in the long term, or that one of the products will be substantially larger than the other? Um, sure. Uh, Todd, I hate to keep doing this to you, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to do it. These are great questions, so uh, so thank you, Frank. In reference to the, uh, the Tizari cream, we are uh, pleased with the most recent week-over-week week performance for... Uh, for that product, and I think that there's a couple of things here that are uh, creating some, some, some definitely some, some positive uh, tailwinds for us, and that is that um, you know with the launches of Refoam and creating a portfolio of products, um, this has really resonated with the providers as far as Zuri Cream across these two patient populations of psoriasis and Sebderm, creating a halo effect uh, on both products to include the Zuri Cream. Not only that, um, but um, you know we have um, expanded our field sales organization. Uh, that we expanded it by roughly 40 representatives. That was fully executed on July 1st of this year. So I think that ad additional share of voice is starting to have a positive impact relative to our uh, Zareed Cream and Psoriasis brand performance. And then in reference to um, you know foam. Uh, once again, we're very encouraged by the performance of the phone, especially in the last weeks. We're seeing very positive uh, week-over-week -week prescription growth. And relative to, uh, you know, the split on the business between um, psoriasis and foam, I, I would anticipate that we will have a, a higher, uh, uh, you know, weekly uh, TRX uh, prescriptions in, eventually in foam than we want psoriasis. Because the, the market is so much larger uh, relative to Sebderm and foam, uh, there's no branded competition within that market. There's been no innovation in many years. 
And so it creates a great opportunity relative to you know, the value proposition that we offer to these patients. And we continue to hear very, very encouraging and positive uh, feedback, not only from the dermatology community, but uh, from patients. So I think that that's what we can expect going forward. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Seamus Fernandez with Google Hein. Your line is open. Well, thanks, thanks very much, and uh, congrats on the uh, on the quarter and all the progress. Um, a couple questions on the uh, progression and AB and how we should think about it. Um, one question that I have is, is just as uh, Kawa comes on to you know expand the promotion of uh, Zareev. Can you help us understand, you know, some of the key impact points um, and how we should be thinking about the prospect of acceleration there? Um, and then separately, uh, just hoping to understand how you're thinking about the opportunity in the pediatric AD setting. Um, obviously, that's another uh, SNDA file would bring the uh, availability of Zareev to a very important younger patient population. Um, interested to know how you're thinking about uh, the promotion um, in that uh, in that setting, and uh, and the importance of it as well. Yeah, Seamus, uh, y your second question. You're asking about the two to five year olds. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Todd, maybe if you could take the question about COA and then. Patrick, maybe you could kick us off on a question around AD just from a clinical standpoint. You want to start, Patrick? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take that question. Thanks, Shamus, for the question. I appreciate it. So when we're thinking about uh, pediatric AD, that two to five-year-old represents about 10% of the AD patients that are in dermatologists' office. Um, you know, but I think what's really important is to keep in mind that the pediatric AD community is already very much involved in our launch, given that we have six to 11 year olds um, with the 0.15% approval that we just had in July, as well as adolescents. And both of those are kind of core patients for this pediatric uh, AD uh, training community. So, you know, I, I think that we're already really heavily engaged with them. And then as we bring the age range down into the two to five year olds, we'll just be able to kind of build upon that and if you think back to the data that we had uh, for two to five year olds, it's very, very consistent with what we have for ages six and above. So it'll seem like a very natural extension, I think, uh, as we add on that additional uh, age to the indication. And then, Shane, if this all was clear, your, your first question was in reference to the progression of AD and our expanded promotion and kind of what are some of the key impact points? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so first and foremost, um, we're very pleased with the start of the atopic dermatitis launch. Uh, we're receiving very positive feedback from the dermatology community, and I think some of the key impact points that um, that we're looking at is, I think, first and foremost, is for the uh, EHR, electronic health records, um, to to have them all brought online to where uh, Zuri Cream 0.15 percent or uh, 80 is loaded up into the EHRs. We've been actively working on that. I expect that to uh, to happen over the next uh, couple weeks. The other is we've mentioned access that two of the PBMs now have uh, treated atopic dermatitis to the line extension. I think another key driver accelerator will be when that third PBM comes online, uh, which will anticipate that to, to come online uh, very likely uh, next month. Uh, the other is is that uh, you know we have the EHR, we have the access, we have the promotion. We've got to make certain that we're driving covered scripts. Um, so um, we are working hand in hand with our um, uh, the pharmacies within our contracted pharmacy network, just to make certain that um, you know that we can drive uh, coverage scripts with those pharmacies. We're also working with the uh, dermatology offices uh, relative to the PA process, and I think we have a significant strategic advantage here. And as we mentioned before, that these offices or the pharmacies, you know, it's the same coverage across the three different products, same copay card, same contracted pharmacy network. So we see a lot of synergies that are being built here uh, across the offices and pharmacies to drive those cover scripts. Um, so I think we couple those together, uh, we'll be well on our way to a very successful launch. Yeah, and Seamus, maybe I'll just add, you know, specifically with regard to, um, to COA, 
um, you know, we expect them to start promoting, uh, you know, in the field probably towards the end of this quarter. Um, but as I mentioned in my comments, we don't expect to see, you know, an, an inflection in Zarif growth from the primary care and pediatric piece, probably this year. I, I would expect that to be more of a contributor in 25. You know, very much like when we first launched with plaque psoriasis and dermatology, the primary care and the pediatric doctors don't know Zarif yet. <clears throat> and, um, and so, you know, there's gonna be some education that has to go into that. Um, but, uh, you know, COA has relationships with many of these doctors. They've got a proven track record in the primary care space. So we feel very good about it, but I do think there's going to be a bit of a lag in terms of when we see the impact. You know, I, I would expect to see more in 25 from the primary care deal. <clears throat> and then uh, just with regard to um, the pediatric piece, I, I would also just point out that, you know, we, we do anticipate also in the future uh, studying um, Zarif in three to 24 month olds. That's something probably that will come post approval in the two to five year old. But again, I think it's an important uh, opportunity both um, in the dermatology setting, but also, especially in the pediatric setting, as you know, there are many 80 patients below the age of two. Great. And then maybe just one question. Is there a point where, you know, David and Frank, you are, you know, and, and Todd are all carefully looking at the value contribution of a broader, you know, sort of DTC campaign? Um, where do you think that starts to become most impactful? Is that kind of, you know, end of 2025, 2026, um, there have been good returns on DTC advertising, but just wondering how you're thinking about spend. So, uh, you know, I think um, we have a direct-to-consumer program ongoing all the time. And, you know, we've added, we expanded that with, uh, with uh, Seb Durham, and we will expand it further with uh, atopic dermatitis. You know, I think specifically with regard to broadcast TV, um, you know, th that's something that we, we are constantly evaluating. Uh, I don't know if or when we will, you know, really ramp up direct, uh, broadcast TV. It's, it's very expensive, right, because you're competing against the likes of Coke and, and Ford, uh, as well as, um, you know, the big biologic companies for buying that advertising space. And the economics for direct-to-consumer TV for, a, you know, a $70,000 a year product is very different than the economics for a product that you know it's probably something like two thousand dollars a year so I, I wouldn't say at this point we've, we've made a commitment to going into broadcast TV it's something that we'll continue to evaluate um, but you know we would only launch that if we felt that there was a, a, a really compelling business case that drove shareholder value great thank you thank you please stand by for our next question <clears throat> our next question comes of OE ear with Mizuho. The line is open. Hey guys, um, yeah, congrats on a solid quarter. Um, thanks for taking our questions. So I guess um, our first question is maybe just help us to understand um, a little bit about the gross and net changes. Um, I think you indicated from low 60s to high 50s, but if you just take the sales number and divide it by the total scripts, um, the net you know, the implied price seems to be relatively flat. Um, so that's sort of the first question. And the second question is, um, could you maybe just help us um, understand, like, the, the proportions of um, pediatric uh, patients in the Durham offices that you currently detail to versus those um, in the primary care uh, and pediatric pediatric um, markets that you're expecting COA to, uh, to go after. Um, yeah, and I, I guess um, maybe thirdly, you indicated that the amended, um, uh, the amended um, term loans has now removed restriction on asset purchases. Just wondering, what do you have in mind in terms of um, BD? Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, so let me take the easiest one first. Um, uh, so in terms of the proportion of PEDS, uh, or of, of children, excuse me, in, in Durham's versus PCP and PEDS, um, I think that uh, uh, Patrick mentioned earlier, in dermatology offices, it's only about 10% of the AD patients they're seeing are, are children, uh, the 90% being adolescents and adults. Um, it's a very different picture in primary care where, you know, in, in the pediatric offices, all of the kids obviously are, are pediatric and the majority of the 
the pediatric AD population are sitting with pediatricians, which is why we think this PCP co-promote is so important. There are a lot of adults as well who uh, are seen by PCPs and not by dermatologists. I think that's you know, both a function of the difficulty of seeing a dermatologist, you know, in many cities around the country, it's a six month wait to see a dermatologist, but also, uh, and Patrick can comment on this too, I think many PCPs feel very comfortable treating uh, eczema as opposed to psoriasis. <clears throat> um, and then, um, you know, Todd, maybe you can talk a little bit more about the, the gross to net changes. Um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure I'm clear about your comment about uh, the implied price, but um, Todd can talk about uh, the gross nets in, in a little more detail. And then when, after he's done, we'll get David to address the, the debt uh, and business development. Yeah, in, in reference to the uh, to the gross to nets, um, what's been driving, first, what's been driving the improvement in gross to net? Uh, what's probably been driving that is the, um, the increased uh, number of covered prescriptions. Uh, that we've had in place, and that's um, there's, there's kind of a three factors that are driving that. First, is we have had some improvement in relative to our um, our market access, which gives us the opportunity to increase the um, the percent of product that's now being covered uh, by the uh, insurance companies. The other is is that um, you know we've um, we've had a, a, as mentioned earlier a nice acceleration of gross to net improvement was the refoam with the uh, three PBM line extensions that have happened there. Um, you know, a little bit of a higher volume in Sebderm. Um, that's, um, you know, give it a positive mix when you blend the two together to give us improvements also uh, within our gross to net. In addition to that, um, some of the changes that we've made with our copay card uh, to create efficiencies in uh, covered prescriptions versus non-covered prescriptions and how those are accounted for has also uh, lended to, uh, to to this improvement. So well, I'm not sure if that explains it. If there's further questions, I'm happy to answer. No, no, that, that can... explains it. Um, thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, on, on the prior questions, I was also wondering, you know, whether there's a large proportion of, um, of pediatrics or uh, patients in the primary, you know, and psoriasis as well in septderm that have not, that have gone untouched. Yeah. So yes. Um, so uh, you know, we've stated before about a third, roughly, of the primary of the psoriasis population is treated outside of dermatology. Um, you know, that's a little bit scarier disease, quite frankly, for non-dermatologists. So they tend to refer more. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, eczema or, or atopic dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis, uh, you know, many doctors are comfortable treating those uh, patients um, in um, in their own practice. And so about half of the eczema population and roughly half of the subderm population are uh, are outside of dermatology. And then I think it's also important to note that particularly subderm uh, and, and and to some extent eczema and psoriasis, there are a fair number of patients who are also not being treated. Um, you know, they've even either given up or they don't realize they have a treatable condition. And I think that over time we may see some growth in the marketplace, uh, particularly in in seborrheic dermatitis. Um, going for patients who weren't on drug previously coming on to to our drug. Okay. And that David, can you maybe talk a little bit about the the debt revisions as specifically a business development, sort of our thinking around business development? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted us to address the, some of the math around gross to net, which I can do for a moment if you like. Uh, so, so um, I, I don't know. Have we addressed your questions around gross to net? Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I was sort of wondering about the mixed, um, so, and I think you guys have sort of explained it, but David, feel free to address the math, yes. Oh, the, the only thing I was going to add is, you know, same, same thing we talked about multiple times at the end of last quarter, right? The way we've chosen to handle commercially cover, uh, I'm sorry, commercially insured but uncovered scripts makes it difficult for you to calculate the exact gross to net. Uh, you don't have all the inputs you need, but it is in the 50s. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then, David, can and I'm you sorry. take a uh, question about business development? Yeah, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the business development question? Um, uh, you removed the uh, restrictions on uh, the, the asset restrictions, uh, asset purchase restriction yeah. on the amended um, term loan. Just wondering yeah. what you have in mind. Um, well, the, the the original agreement um, had a had a hard dollar cap, 
um, on asset acquisitions. That's in this in our amendment that has been removed. Yeah, and, and then you know I think going more more broadly, uh, you know I think we think of business development as um, a, a potential opportunity, but not a necessity, right? We, you know we've got. Um, you know, yeah. three very strong products now approved, a fourth one we just filed. Uh, you know, we have some earlier stage programs in our pipeline. Um, and, and we have a pretty high bar in terms of buying things, right? We don't need to go out and buy revenue because of the products that we have and the products we have in our pipeline. But, um, you know, we're always looking, uh, you know, um, and, and if something came along that we felt we could create additional uh, shareholder value with, we certainly would would think very seriously about that. Um, you know, I think we've built a, a wonderful development organization, both in R and D and in, in technical operations. And so, you know, finding something that we think is a diamond in the rough, like ARQ 234, is something we're always looking for. Uh, but we're not looking to do, you know, at this point in the game, you know, some sort of a roll up where we're just adding a bunch of, of revenue that doesn't really create shareholder value. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Serge Belanger with Needham. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Um, first one on, on managed care coverage. I think over the last uh, couple updates, you've highlighted you've secured uh, Medicaid coverage from some prominent states. Just curious where you stand on, on Medicare and I guess where you expect to be once we flip to 2025 and the COA uh, co-promote um, begins. And also related to that, I think in the past you, you've mentioned that you expected your Medicare and Medicaid book a business to be as profitable as uh, the commercial book. Has, has that, have those expectations changed now that you um, decided to secure that coverage? Yeah, sure. Uh, great question, Serge. Um, uh, Todd, you want to take those two? Yeah, absolutely. First, in reference to Medicaid, as, as mentioned earlier, we've been able to secure coverage uh, in Texas, Florida, uh, and New York. Um, we are, um, you know, in negotiations with other uh, states for Medicaid, and those, those uh, negotiations are moving forward, and we're having very positive conversations. And so, I expect to pick up uh, additional coverage uh, with Medicaid states as we roll through 2024. Uh, in reference to Medicare, um, we continue to have positive dialogues with the, uh, the the PBMs that manage the Part D plans, and we expect, as you mentioned, we roll over uh, 2025 and into the co-op uh, partnership relative uh, to Medicare. Um, we do expect to be able to have uh, some Medicare access uh, as we initiate and go into uh, 2025. Those conversations uh, with those Part D plans are going well, and uh, and the coverage would very likely be initiated on 2025, although we are having conversations about the potential to pull some of that forward uh, into uh, 2024. And then, Todd, can you also comment on, on what we expect gross to nets to look like uh, in Medicare and Medicaid versus commercial? Yeah, absolutely. So relative to gross to nets, um, I, we're, we're uh, in a very good position, and uh, that's uh, a result of the strategic pricing, the WAC pricing for Zuri that falls below the specialty product threshold within uh, of Medicare. So we won't have to pay uh, you know, exorbitant uh, uh, rebates uh, to the Part D plans to be able to secure that access. Uh, it, uh, once we secure that access, it should have a very uh, nominal impact on our gross to net. Uh, likewise, uh, within Medicaid, we're in a very good position and what we've had to uh, negotiate there relative to discounts, uh, we should have uh, you know, minimal to no impact uh, on our gross relative to the Medicaid access that we're securing. So, um, you know, we, we strategically price the product that way, and it's starting to, uh, to play out strategically for us, both across Medicaid and Medicare, very positively. Great. And maybe a follow-up on uh, a prior question regarding the Grid Connect calculations for the quarter, and, and regarding more specifically to a program where you account um, uh, commercially insured but non-covered scripts and how they don't impact the copay card. I don't know if you can disclose how many, the, the volume of scripts going through that program and whether it's increasing or, or stable uh, from quarter to quarter. 
Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to to address that question. So, um, relative to the to the program that we mentioned as far as the volume going through that versus the um, what I'll frame as the traditional uh, program that we have, um, we we do see a a high level of the uh, ZRE volume going through that new program, which is having a positive impact on our gross to net, uh, and we anticipate that that will um, you know. It is a high volume, so it will increase, but modestly, because it's, it is a pretty significant part of our volume that is now flowing through there. Uh, and we anticipate this uh, as we ramp up in atopic dermatitis, we would expect the same thing. Yeah, and you know, Serge, I, I might just emphasize again, um, you know, what we're really focused on is covered prescriptions, right? Because you know, shareholders don't make money on a non-covered script. In fact, you know, normally you lose money on a non-covered script. So um, we have taken to telling you guys what percentage the scripts of our scripts are covered. And, and Todd mentioned, I think, earlier in, in the conversation, about four and five of the cream scripts currently are being reimbursed by insurance, and about three and four of the foam scripts are being reimbursed by insurance. So those are, those are fully paid scripts, right? Yeah. Um, and so you guys can do the math. And, and our, the gross net that we're reporting is on the scripts that are covered because there is no gross to net on an uncovered script because right, you're not getting paid anything for them. Yeah, and Frank, on that note, I will mention that um, if we look at branded topical products, and when you, when you were able to accomplish four out of five per scripts are covered, that's a, um, that's a very high number of scripts as far as covered when you look at branded topicals. Yep, thanks for the call. Good point, yep. Thank you. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, let's start one one to ask the question. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Chris Shabitani with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Great, thank you very much, Frank and team. Congratulations on the progress. Two questions directionally, if I could. One, financial. As I think about operating expenses and the possibility that you could inflect towards uh, positive EBITDA at some point over the next uh, several quarters or years, what are the factors that now that you have the partnership in place are guiding how we should be thinking about your own SGNA levers? That seems to be one of the toggles that could help drive towards that profitability here. Um, and then secondly, to talk about the pipeline a little bit, 255, any uh, insight into when we could learn about that? Because you know we get impatient and what have you done for me lately? You do have a pipeline, uh, you're focused on dermatology, uh, tremendous commercial success, but we're going to be increasingly curious in the months ahead and quarters ahead about what else you could be having uh, in terms of portfolio and particularly in the pipeline. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Shib. Um, so, David, you want to take the uh, question around profitability, and then, Patrick, could you maybe address the, uh, the pipeline? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm not going to comment on timing to profitability or, or break even, but what I will say, obviously, Break, if you break S, G, and A into S on the one hand and G, and A on the other hand, selling obviously is, is you know, always going to be pretty closely correlated with, with, with revenue. So the way, you, the way you get to break even in this kind of business, obviously, is, is through economies of scale on the G and the A items, right? And, and, and we're certainly experiencing that already. We watch it very closely. And we look at it in our own internal projections, and I, I think uh, you know, it's well on its way to the sort of levels that you'd want it to be at, okay? Now, obviously, circumstances can change. Um, when you launch products like AD, for example, or launch a PCP program, you do, you do incur some, some startup costs and things like that. But in general, if you strip out those one-time items, the G and the A are, are moving in the direction that you'd like to see them in to achieve what you're referring to. I, 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 maybe the only, the only amplifying comment I would, I would add to that is, you know, should as primary care starts to kick in and drive top line revenue, um, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, we aren't spending our money or shareholders money, um, you know, to drive that business, right? That that's really um, coming from the partner side. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's something that will, will give us more leverage in terms of profitability. It's, it's, it's revenues without expenses really. Yeah, that, that's yeah. reassuring on the partnership front. So, and then on the pipeline, two five five. I think we're in phase one. When do we get a yeah, some of the sure. profile? Patrick, you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, our our kind of historical precedent has been that we're when we're conducting a clinical trial, when we get to where we've had the last patient enrolled, 
then we'll kind of make a uh, statement about when we anticipate having the the data. You know, up until that point, um, you know, we just want to make sure that we're being precise with regard to you know any prognostication that we provide on uh, on timing. So you know, as we move towards having last patient in, we'll like make an announcement on the on two five five. You know, just today we did include an update on the ARQ two thirty four, which is the CD two hundred. Uh, receptor agonist, you know, kind of noting that we're uh, planning to do an IND filing there in 2025. You know, as we get closer to that, we will kind of continue to refine the, the date. So now we've kind of put that up on the map as well today. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm showing no further questions in the queue. I will now like to turn the call back to Frank for closing remarks. Okay, well, um, appreciate everyone making time in their day to join us today and, and for the great questions. And uh, look forward to, uh, to speaking to everyone uh, in um, about 90 days for the next quarter. Thanks again for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.